And there's nothing really new. Same statement pretty much as last time, except for some language noting slower growth. So is there anything to see here or is it or in central banking land? Is it really all about the ECB now this week? Is at stake with this ECB decision or, or with what Mario Draghi comes out and says? Because Thursday, that was a real big whoa for everyone when he said the ECB is going to support the euro and it's going to work. So now what's what's everybody expecting tomorrow? Are very, very high for the ECB to really do something. But we saw with, with expectation that, that the ECB would uh, reinstate that SP program, buying bonds directly. Right after all those hopes came out with that Mario Draghi statement, the Bundesbank kind of poured cold water on that and said, hey, we're opposed to this. And the Bundesbank is very powerful. So I'm curious, has the German calculus changed now that we got these PMI numbers out and Germany is not doing well looking at them? I mean, this is not a good report when, it look, when you're looking at German manufacturing. Germany is always the one saying, no, we are holding to austerity. We are not going to do what everybody else is trying to push us into doing. Do you think this is a game changer for Germany in the calculus of crisis politics? I lines too, because every day there are different headlines about the Eurozone crisis with a policymaker saying this hopeful thing or this horrible thing that, that, that sounds scary. And there's a lot of stock that seems to be put in these statements. And, and it seems, at least, or, 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 or media reporters attach to market movements these statements and a reaction to them. But how much stock can you really put in them? I mean, these are politicians. We know how much stock to put in to what Obama or Mitt Romney says in an election year. Yeah. Analyst. People have to, a whole new industry of headline analysts to try and figure out how Angela Merkel is feeling today and what that means for the global economy. But um, going into the, the poster child of, of the problem in, in Europe, or at least who it seems to be judging by a lot of the front page stories lately, is Spain. And one interesting thing mm -hmm. is that now regions are possibly reportedly needing bailouts from the central government. And, and the prime minister is trying to uh, enact austerity at the regional level in these regions too. Too. But there's a deeper dynamic going on here that you've really looked at. What is the deeper dynamic between the regions and the central government of Spain that plays into this economic calculus? As people look at Spain and say, okay, it has all of these economic problems, but, you know, a housing bubble that's burst, that sort of thing. But its debt to GDP ratio is below the, the Eurozone average. And you're making such an interesting point, which is that, hey, it was that low because of the fact that it pushed all of these costs onto the regions that now they can't afford and they need bailouts from Spain. So I guess my question is, is do you think that that's really where this gets really ugly because if Spain's regions are going bankrupt or at least need bailouts and they have all of these uh, costs that they have to pay out that they can't, I mean, is this really where the rubber meets the road? Like, if the ECB doesn't buy more time, where they're going to be in that situation again, and it's this constant kind of crisis mode that we've been in. I appreciate you giving that insight. I want you to stay right. You've been involved in all aspects of credit trading. So how significant is it that these swaps aren't yet on exchanges as Dodd-Frank wanted them to be, presumably? Yeah. Still not on exchange. Every six months to a year it pops up. You know, last year the big concern was what's happening to Morgan Stanley's credit derivatives, their swaps. And since you said that you are able to kind of see through these headlines and dissect what really is going on here with these markets, I want to talk about LIBOR because swaps factor into LIBOR manipulation because from what I understand, when it comes to swaps, one part of those deals in most cases LIBOR was used. So now that we're seeing all of these civil suits and the potential for many, many more, I mean, is this a Pandora's box? Do I have this right? That potentially LIBOR manipulation could be involved in one part of many of these trillions of dollars worth of swaps? There, you know I have to ask, which are those banks that you found to be most exposed? <laughs> point to end on. I appreciate you being here to give all of your insight to these issues. Truly an interesting first uh, experience and appearance on Capital Account. I appreciate you for being all right, let's wrap up with loose change. Though that was a tough act to follow. Interesting it was tough. That was a really that was a very good interview. Lauren. Yeah, was very, he was Peter Cheer is a very interesting guy. And very smart. That was guy. very very well done. Very good interview. All right, so let's try to be, I guess, funny. <laughs> uh, do you want to squash risk and increase returns on your stocks? Well, just turn to the superior sex when it comes to company boards. Harder workers and they're better at assessing risk is what you're saying. Well, there, I didn't say that they're better at assessing here, but we have two of the board members, guys, uh, and uh, and here we have CFGE, and uh, then we got Jamie Dimon there, others on the board and the mothering instincts. 
And that's the good thing about women. We, look, a way to well, really play that's why the Adam stereotype. Adam, so it's about being a good mother to the company. Well, they have good no, mothering I think instincts. I think the mother in general work harder or more sensible. They take less for themselves. So men are so they're, lazy. So they're more. Uh, that's ridiculous. Not no, as a it's generalization, that, but women are, I, no, women this are, is purely anecdotal. But I do think women are more like in the trenches, toughing it out, sink or swim. Speaking of swim, let's move on. The 2012 Summer Olympics are underway. A lot of swimmers from the U.S. have done pretty well. All athletes are eyeing a medal. Here's U.S. gymnast Shawn Johnson's take on her quest to get the gold back in 2008. Yeah, well, U.S. athletes in particular may want to read the fine print coming from the IRS on those winnings. Since the U.S. taxes worldwide prize income earned overseas by its taxpayers, according to the Americans for Tax Reform, American gold medal winners will pay the IRS about nine grand in taxes. What a crock. And, and according to the <laughs> Americans for Tax Reform, other competitors aren't going to have to deal with this because they don't have the same kind of tax codes in most other well, countries. And apparently the, gold, the, the, the <laughs> swimmers are breaking their teeth trying to bite the gold. Yeah. It's not real gold. It's like some kind of like, you know, iron or something. You no, know, I, I, this is a case where I think that it is immoral to tax prize winnings from the Olympics. I mean, come on. Well, what makes it, wait, hold on, let's take it a step further. Why is it moral to tax? You're going to talk about income tax. Well, what about artists? What about them. artists? Why should they be taxed for their, if they, if they create a piece of music and they sell that music and they get all this money from it, why should they be taxed insane amounts of money in that? I mean, how exactly, I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I, yeah, I understand we're going down certain the cases if you're, if you're running a business where you're using infrastructure. I mean, there's certain things that are just absurd that, you, that the government takes takes yeah. a bite out of. Yeah, okay? I'm with you. I'm with you on this one. I'm with that on basketball players, too. They shouldn't be taxed. <laughs> all right. We'll leave you with that because that's all we have time we'll for. We'll help them. Thanks so much for watching, and be sure to come back tomorrow. And in the meantime, you know you can follow me on Twitter, at Lauren Lister. Give us feedback on this show or catch any you missed at YouTube.com slash Capital Account. Subscribe, too, if you haven't. Plus, you can catch us in HD. It's the only place you can catch us in HD. That's on Hulu at Hulu.com slash Capital dash Account. Come back tomorrow. We're going to have a fun guest, convicted fraudster who now is going to tell us all about it. But for now, have a great night.